Well, if you have your Bible this morning, I ask you to go ahead and turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. And this morning we find ourselves in verses 7 through 11. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, we've been making our way verse by verse. And this morning I want to do something just a, a little bit different. I want to, we're going to look at these verses, but we won't exhaust all that's here, but I really want to deal with uh, the topic of the, the descent of Christ. Uh, did Christ actually go to hell after the cross? And so that's something that we're going to deal with based on this passage of Scripture. So it will be a, a theological in that sense. Everything's theological. Amen. Chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7. Paul writes, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also has descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also, he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we bless you this morning. We praise you. We are grateful for who you are because there is none like you. And oh, God, we just want to worship you, and we want to exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And even as we sang a moment ago, we bless you and we praise you for the blood of Christ. For we know that without the shedding of blood, that there is no remission for our sin. But Christ shed his own blood on our behalf, and it is through his blood that we have atonement for our sin. It is through His blood that we are able to draw near to You. So we're able, Lord, to come into Your presence this morning because of the precious blood of Your Son. And we thank You that we have been purchased by this blood. And Lord, as we consider the atonement and the work of Christ, and as we begin to look at this passage that is before us, Help us, Lord, to see what Christ has done. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves in light of what He has done in us. Let us glory in the work of Jesus. For it's in His name we pray. Amen. Well, unity is what we have been talking about for the last several weeks. Unity. That's the theme that Paul addresses in the first part of this chapter. I I want to go ahead and talk about unity just for a few moments leading into this section because uh, we won't go back to those verses again, but simply to just mention quickly three things that we have been emphasizing in unity. And one of those things that we have talked about week after week is it is the spirit that produces or creates uh, this unity. And we've emphasized that over these last few weeks, in fact, you see in verses 4 through 6, this oneness. Uh, there is one body, there's one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. One, one, one. Seven times in those verses 4 through 6. And so it is the spirit that produces this. We could say it is the spirit that applies this unity, because as we, even as we walk through this book in chapter 2, we saw that it is Christ who is our peace. He, he is the one who has uh, done away with, demolished those barriers, those barriers between men and those barriers between us and God. He's the mediator. He's the one who's enabled us to have peace with God. He is our peace. And this unity that we have, we we see this, that the Spirit is the one who um, 
produces this. It is the Spirit who regenerates us, that, that creates us and makes us a, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And, and having been made a new creation in Christ Jesus, we become part of this body. And as we emphasize last time, uh, we see that these uh, verses 4 through 6 really, um, uh, really is the, the, um, the emphasis, the foundation of uh, what it means to be a part of this body. And so, put it differently, what we see in verse, verses 4 through 6 is that if, we're, if we've been regenerated, if we've been created anew by the Spirit of God, then, then these things are true of us, that there is one Lord, that there is one baptism, there is one faith, there is one hope. And so it's the Spirit who does this. And, and I emphasize that because uh, what, what, what we're seeing is um, the Spirit at work, and we see uh, Christ and, and the Father, as we talked about last week, this, this, um, all three of the members of the Godhead are, are at work in our salvation. But the Spirit is the one who produces this, and then secondly, we're the ones who are called upon or exhorted to preserve this unity. And that's what we're supposed to be about, is diligently, as verse 3 tells us, uh, preserving the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what we're to be about. And what does that look like? Well, verse 2 tells us what it looks like. It's, it's, in, it's with humility. It's with patience. Uh, you, you see all of those things in uh, verse uh, 2, that, we're, uh, that we have this uh, uh, patience, that we have this uh, love for one another, able to bear things. I was thinking as I uh, was looking at that passage of Scripture even this week, that everything comes out of that humility as we talked about. But it's amazing at how love plays a factor in this. If we have a, a love that the Spirit has made us a, a new creation, we have a love for one another, it's amazing how much tolerance we can have for one another. I, th I think about my grandchildren, and, and, uh, and sometimes they will... They'll wear me out, you know, if, if, when, when, when they ask me to just, to, you know, throw them up in the, in the air. And it's like, you know, one more time, one more time. You parents know what I'm talking about. Just one more time. Well, you said that six times ago, but it's just one more time. But it's amazing what you will do for love and the tolerance that you have for one another for love. The tolerance I have for you, the tolerance that you have for me. But it is this preserving this preservation of unity that we come back to those verses in verses um, 4 through 6 that it's, it's upon doctrine, it's upon truth. This, this is where we're to preserve the unity. And, and, I, and I bring this out to say this third point and then we'll get into the passage. And that is this, that, that unity is not uniformity. That unity is not uniformity. In other words, I think sometimes the church, in the perspective of what unity means, it, 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 we've got it somewhat confused that it's more of a, a uniform than unity, more uniformity. In, in other words, we've got to do everything, we've got to look just alike. I was thinking about this in terms of the, um, the homeschool and the and the uh, Christian school, something that we've been talking about in recent days. Uh, we've been talking about this project. One, one of the things that we, I don't much talk about this in this setting, but, um, but we're going to have a, a, a conference afterwards, and we'll get into some of this. But you'll recall that I was encouraging us to, to put some of that, that money that we're using towards missions. One of the greatest mission fields is our children. And, and coming along beside those parents who are homeschooling or those who are putting uh, their children in, in Christian school and, and helping them, uh, taking some of that money and putting it there. And, and I understand that in doing that, that there's some of the folks are, are not in unison with that. And, and, and here's the reality is that for some people, uh, you know, and, and some people go to way to the, to the extreme in this regard, they'll say something to the effect of, well, you know, if you really loved your kids, you wouldn't put them in public school. You'd only put them in a uh, private school or, or homeschool them. 
And, and then you go to the other extreme, and they'll say, well, uh, you know, if, if you put your kids in, in homeschool, well, then, you know, they're not learning the social skills that they need to learn, and so how, how are they going to function in this world? And you got two extremes, and, and really, the, the truth is, is that the Scripture doesn't tell us where we ought to have them in school or whether we ought to have them uh, in public school or in private school. It just says we ought to be discipling our kids. We know that. And, and what I want to say is that we, we can... We can have some variances in that. We, we don't have to all do it the same way. We don't have to all say, well, this is just going to be a homeschool church. We're not going to do that. Some people say, well, that would that be a good thing. Well, it could be a good thing. But what I'm saying is, is that we, we can all agree that we have a responsibility to disciple our children. And, and all, we'll get into this more in the meeting, but all we're looking to do is, is come alongside those parents. I'll take that as an amen. <laughs> come alongside those parents. I mean, we're, we're just looking to do that. The, the point I want to emphasize is, is that we don't have to all be uniform to be in unity. And, and that also goes in the area of all of our theological beliefs. We don't have to all be all on the same page. Now, there are some fundamentals, and I think at the very minimum, what we see in verses 4 through 6, that we all have to agree with that. But even as you think about that in baptism, for example, we can have unity in baptism with our Presbyterian brothers. Uh, now, we come at baptism in a different place. We, we come from what we believe the Scripture teaches is that baptism is by immersion, now, that there's a believer's baptism. I understand that Presbyterians come at this in a different way. They, they understand baptism. I won't get into all of that. But I do know what they believe. I've taken the time to understand what they believe. And, and they're not saying that baptism is salvific. They're, in other words, they're not saying, like those in the uh, Church of Christ would say, that, that baptism brings about regeneration. Now, that's not my brother. I can be a brother with a Presbyterian that has a, a different view of baptism but understands that, that salvation is in Christ alone, faith alone, by grace alone. I can still be a brother with that person, but someone who adds to the work of Christ, well, that's not my brother because that's not the gospel. And, and so what I'm saying is before we give our Presbyterian brothers or uh, others that uh, may hold to a different view on baptism, I think they would agree that we would be in the same place in Romans chapter 6, that we are buried with Christ, die with Christ, buried with Christ, and raised with Christ, and that the, the water baptism is, is just a representation of that. All that to say that our response to our Presbyterians Brothers ought to be what we see in verse number two, which is a place of humility, uh, trying to understand what they believe, being patient, uh, able to teach, as Paul tells Timothy. You know, talk with our brothers instead of taking the high place of, well, y'all are just wrong. And now I think they are, but but, but I'm just saying, I, I, I believe I wouldn't be a Baptist if I didn't if I didn't believe that. I think they're but but they're still my brother and sister in Christ. And so, so I, I understand that we can agree to disagree, and I think probably one of the better examples of that before he went to be home with the Lord was uh, R.C. Sproul and his relationship and friend, fellowship with John MacArthur. All that to say that this unity is what Paul is emphasizing and he does it in the context of walking in a manner worthy of the calling. So understanding what Christ has done, this work of salvation, uh, all three members of the triune Godhead at work, understanding that, we're to walk in light of that. We're to be humble in the way that we carry this out. But all of this is, is really diligently, we want to preserve this unity. But it's interesting because what he does, having talked about unity is he immediately, beginning in verse number 7, begins to talk about a diversity within the unity. Notice the contrast in verse number 7. 
And notice what he does. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So to each one of us. And then he talks about these gifts. Uh, he, he's going to, there's a parenthetical there in verses 8 through 10. We're going to deal with it in a moment. But he picks up in verse number 11, where he says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. So the contrast that we see in verse 7 is a, a contrast between the all, which he has mentioned in the previous section, and the each in verse 7. So all members are of one body, but some have received, uh, well, but each, I should say, have received a gift. And that's what we're going to talk about next time more specifically, but I just want to kind of highlight what he's doing here. He's, he's pointing out that each one of us, grace was giving, given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So Christ has given a gift. And by the way, if you are a believer in Christ, then you have this gift. I've always kind of thought about this up until my study this week. I've always thought about the gift in the sense of that we have a particular gift, and some people have more than one gift. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 4 through 6, it talks about the variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. And then Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. So it's the Spirit who distributes these gifts. It's Christ who, as we'll see in a moment, is the one who is the giver of the gift, but is the Holy Spirit who is the distributor, the one who applies the gift. Again, thinking about our salvation, that we are regenerated, we're created, made a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Spirit is the one who does this work, and it, at that moment that we are given a gift. And the Spirit is the one who wills to give us a gift. Now, let me just make a statement here, because I know that there are some denominations and some groups out there that, that uh, pray and ask for gifts. But that's contrary to what we see in the Scripture. The Scripture teaches that it is the Spirit who wills. It is the Spirit who chooses to give us these particular gifts. Romans 12, verses 4 through 6, also a passage that has to do with the gifts. We see that for just as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function... So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So he's saying something similar there to the Romans. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 a moment. And one more passage that deals with this idea of gifts that I think will give us a little bit of light and understanding. It's the shortest list in terms of detailing the, the gifts for us. It really just speaks about the gifts in terms of speaking gifts and serving gifts. It doesn't elaborate on them. But notice what it does in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. It says that as each one has received a special gift... Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do one as, as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what Peter tells us, look back at verse 10 is that each one has received a special gift. Singular. And I'll emphasize that so that we get back to Ephesians. Each one has received a special gift, singular, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Multicolored, if you will, grace of God. So let's go back to see what he says in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 4. 
He says to each one of you, each one of us, grace was given. Grace it could be translated gift. Uh, it's where we would understand the word charismatic from. But, but all this to say that each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So again, it's in the singular. So grace, and we, we saw this with Peter a while ago, this multicolored grace. But there is a gift that Christ gives us. And, and the way I understand this, and we, again, we, we made some references to, to Romans and, and to Corinthians about the, the various gifts. But the way I understand that is that Christ has given each of us a gift. Now, now the, in this multicolored grace of God, this gift looks different for all of us. In other words, you, I think about my gift in uh, a preaching that he's called me to, to preach and proclaim the word of God. And, and my giftedness looks different than the pastor down the street or the preacher down the road. Uh, your giftedness to serve looks different. We, we, we all have, uh, according to the grace of God, the way that he gifts us, we are uniquely different. Now, this is interesting when you think about that. Uh, it is the Spirit who puts us, Romans 12, it is the Spirit who gives us this gift, applies this gift to us, and puts us within the body to serve the body, and we are uniquely gifted to serve the body. So I, I, I take that as the body of Christ, but I also take that even to say that this local body, that God has uniquely gifted you in such a way to serve this body of Christ that is here. I may have to go down there and amen myself if y'all are not going to amen. I mean, I, just think, I mean, think about that for a moment. You have been uniquely gifted. Now, now let me just mention the implication of that. If you, and, and by the way, this is only for the believer. It's those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that God has gifted you, that Christ has given you this gift, the Spirit has applied it to you, you're to employ that gift. And if you're not using that gift, you're not using what Christ has given you to use. We'll talk about that more as we talk in more detail about the gifts going ahead. But I want you to notice next what he does. Because in talking about the gifts, I will mention that he goes on to quote from Psalm 68:18. It's a reference to a psalm that describes, uh, as he's talking about Jesus uh, distributing these gifts, Psalm 68 is a, is a psalm of triumph, and it quite possibly was written in celebration of bringing the ark of God to Jerusalem, but it pictures God as having been victorious over his and Israel's enemies and of now ascending his throne to receive gifts and the homage of all men. And so, in this sense, that what Paul is doing is he's ascribing this glory to Jesus. That he is due all these gifts, and that Jesus is the one who distributes these gifts to men. There's two things I see going on in this passage, and we'll highlight that, that he says that he ascended on high, he led captives, a host of captives. He does something defensively, and I believe he does something offensively. But looking at verse 9 and 10, this is where uh, the church throughout the centuries has taken this to mean that this and another passage that we'll look at in 1 Peter in just a moment, that this is where uh, the church tradition, going back to the early uh, Church fathers have said that what is going on here is that Jesus has uh, descended into hell. Look at verse 9 and 10. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Is that what he's talking about? The lower parts of the earth, is he talking about going into hell? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now say amen if you're still with me. 
Here, here's, what he's, here's what the early church has described, that the descending is the descending into hell. But that's not what he says. What he says is that he's descended into the lower regions. And in other words, I, I think what, he's, what Paul is communicating to us is this is the earthly ministry of Jesus. And in the earthly ministry of Jesus that he descended, he was on high, this one who was at the right hand of the Father. He has descended. He, as Philippians chapter 2, he took on the form of a, a bond servant. He, he served. And so he descended and into the lower regions. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. He's come to serve us. He's come to uh, uh, make atonement for us. It speaks of his earthly ministry. And the ascension speaks about his position on high, that he has ascended to be at the right hand of the Father. Now, where this uh, idea comes from about Jesus uh, descending into hell is it comes from verse number 8, where he, um, well, it came from what we just said about the descending part, but, but in verse number 8, where he ascended on high, that he led a captive of host of captives. And, and so the idea is, uh, and again, going back to tradition, and, and I understand that there's a tradition around this. I even, I even understand the, the Apostles' Creed, and, and depending if you take a literal understanding of that creed that Jesus descended into hell, or if that is talking about uh, hell on the cross, I understand this position. I just don't think that's what the Scripture is teaching, that Jesus descended into hell. But the, the idea goes back, the tradition is, uh, looking back from the Old Testament, we know that uh, the place of the grave, grave was called the, the place of uh, Sheol, is, is the term that uh, we see in the Old Testament. And the Sheol that uh, speaks of the grave, it, it, it's a place of, that the, both the, the righteous and the wicked were in Sheol, in the grave. And there are other references to this idea that, that uh, men were held in captivity. And the, and the teaching is, is that when Christ went to the cross, that he not only made atonement for our sin, but the Christos victor, that is that Christ had victory over Satan in hell. Now he did, but he didn't have to go to hell to do so. But the idea is, based on this verse number 8, is that there were those that were held captive. The Satan, uh, prior to the cross, that he held those captive. Now, some go to the extreme, and we, we won't go there this morning, but Luke chapter 16, you know I was going to reference that. Luke chapter 16, you have Abraham bosom, the bosom of Abraham, where the rich man and, and Lazarus, and, and some say that, uh, that the, the place of captivity, the place of the grave of the righteous was in Abraham's bosom. And that in the, uh, the place of the wicked was in, is, is mentioned as Hades there in uh, Luke chapter 16, which is where the rich man was. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. But the idea is that, is that Satan held uh, captive those, they were held in captivity until the cross. And that Jesus went to the cross and having made atonement afterwards, he descended into hell to set the captives free. And that when he ascends into heaven, that he takes the captives with him. But look what it says in verse 8. Is that what it says? I would suggest what he's saying here, therefore it says when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. So it, 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 what it's saying is, is that it's not that he set captives free, but he had a, he led captive a host of captives. In other words, he took a group into captivity. Look over at Colossians for a moment, chapter 2. I think you see this idea beginning in verse number 13. It speaks about when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Look at verse 14. Having counseled out the certificate of debt 
consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, we know all that, but look at verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. It's the same idea what we see in Psalm 68 triumphing over the enemies. It's the same idea that I think that Paul is referring to in Ephesians chapter 4, that he's doing something for the church. He's not only giving gifts to the church, but I I think what we're seeing here is he's taking into captivity those spirits, those demons, if you will. He's taking them out of commission for the advancement of the church. He led captive, so he takes them into captivity. Where is that place at? Well, how does he do that? Well, he didn't tell us all that, does he? I mean, I know we're told in 2 Peter, for example, we're told in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 that he, there's, a, there's some angels that, who had sinned and were being held in a, a place reserved for judgment. If you've ever done a study on that, who is that in reference to? I'm just going to open it all up this morning. That's probably in reference to Genesis chapter 6, which is where those sons of God, the angels, cohabited with the daughters of men. Hello. And they're held in judgment. But here what he is saying, this is the place of Tardis. It's a different place than hell. It seems to be a dark dungeon it seems to be a dark pit that he's reserved until the day of judgment that they are put there we'll get into that in our study in peter on wednesday night but here what he's telling us is that he has disarmed some of those who are in opposition to the church so so he does something defensively he he does something for the church in victory as he ascends into heaven he Disarm. He, he makes a, a public spectacle of those uh, principalities, taking them out of commission, and he gives the church gifts. So these are simultaneously going on. Does something defensively, does something offensively. Gives the church gifts. So we see this here, but we also see in second, First Peter chapter 3, another place that people would see this as that Jesus went to hell. And while I understand that church tradition, and I respect that church tradition, I just don't believe that church tradition. I, I think that the Scripture doesn't teach that. 1 Peter chapter 3 is the other passage that they take to mean that Jesus went to hell. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse number 18, that Christ also died for sins once for all, and the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So he's talking about the atonement of Christ. But notice that he's made alive in the Spirit. And and that's, and that's where he begins to go into verse number 19, it's the Spirit of Christ in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. And he goes on, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting the days of Noah. This is the same idea that we were talking about in the Genesis 6 reference. But notice what he says. The idea is that verse 9, that he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. Now, if you happen to read, be reading from New American Standard, you'll notice that the word now is in italics, that they're now in prison. And why is that in italics? That's because it's supplied. It's not actually there in the Greek text. In other words, to understand what's being said, the translator said, we're going to put this word now so that you can understand that these are now in prison. But is he saying that Jesus went to preach to those in prison? Or is he saying, and I think, again, we'll look at this in more detail when we get to 1 Peter, what it seems to be saying is that in the Spirit of Christ, 
that in the days of Noah, that Christ preached to those spirits that are now in prison. They're now in prison. But the Spirit, Christ preached to those in the days of Noah. And what he does in this is he, he the, the case that he's making is a case that just as um, he's making a correspondence with baptism, that just as Noah was saved through the water, so it is that we're saved through the cleansing of Christ. Well, preacher, you got me all confused now. What, what I'm saying is, is that it seems to be what Paul is emphasizing in Ephesians is that Christ, in his ascension to the right hand of God, gives gifts to the church, and in doing so, takes out a commission some of those who would come against those spirituality, those, those principalities, those spiritual forces that would come against the church. Now, if this is all we had, then certainly we might leave this place with questions, but not that you're not going to leave with some questions, but let me, let me just make one final comment as to why I believe that he's not saying that Jesus went to hell after the death on the cross. And, and I would say, let's turn to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 23. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 23. And I want us to look down to verse 39, and I'm bringing this to a close. But in Luke chapter 23 and verse 39, this is the account of Jesus on the cross. And, and certainly we could have also reference what Jesus says in John chapter 19, verse 30, where he says that it is finished, where he gives up his spirit. In other words, everything is completed. Everything's done to accomplish our atonement. But in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 39, we see one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him and saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered rebuking him and said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here it is. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that paradise is the third heaven now, he doesn't, he's not even allowed to elaborate on that, not able to go into great detail of that. But it seems to be that what Jesus said, I said it seems to be, I mean, it's very clear. He says, today you shall be with me in paradise. He, he didn't say today you're going to be with me in suffering and in agony and pain. You're going to hell with me. No, he says, today you will be with me in paradise, in heaven. The account goes on to say that it was about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. That signifying that everything has been accomplished. We now have access to the Father through the Son. And Jesus, verse 46, crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Today I'll be with you in paradise. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And in John chapter 19, it is finished. So there's not a purpose, there's not a reason for him to go to hell. And it seems to be what the scripture is teaching is that Christ has accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished there on the cross. And in his victory, as the victor, when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he has distributed gifts. Each of us are uniquely gifted. But we're gifted to serve 
the body of Christ, to serve Christ for his glory. I came across an old story this week. Uh, some, some of you remember the old song. Some of you old timers may remember. I heard it this week. Someday, someday we'll be together. The old Diana Ross in the Supreme song. Am I dating myself, ain't I? Some of you younger folks, younger folks look at me like, what are you talking about? But someday, we will, someday we'll be together. I'm, I'm not going to sing it. I'm, you know. Someday. You, you know the song. It's interesting that that song was actually the last number one hit of the 1960s. It, it, it had so many layers in that because uh, it, it was the last song of the 60s. Uh, it was also the last song that Diana Ross sang with the Supremes. And some have suggested that she was not just talking about, uh, in the song, she's talking about a long-distance lover, that, that the other meaning is that well, what she's really talking about is that someday the Supremes will be together again. Uh, Diana Ross later on, noting that song, said that someday we'll be together, that actually it was a reference uh, to uh, what was going on in the civil rights era at that time. And that she was making this claim, uh, this, uh, this song of hope, that someday that we would all be together. And, and certainly we can see where uh, the civil rights era, that there's a lot that has progressed in America since then. There's a lot of that we've regressed over the last few years. But ultimately, we're, I think we're in a better place than we were in the 60s. But here's my point, is that on so many levels, this someday that we'll be together, uh, Ross has this song of hope that one day we'll all be united. But the reality is, is that this world will never be united outside of Christ. That we'll never be, have this uh, bond of peace, that we'll never have this commonality but in the church, it's not that someday we'll all be together, but right now we are all together, that Christ has bonded us together. And having bonded us together, he intends for us, means for us to, to serve this body, to protect and preserve the unity, but to serve the body of Christ with the giftedness that he's given us. We're, we're going to talk about those gifts in more detail. We're going to talk about the church and our function over the next few weeks. Talk about the role of pastors and how they're to serve the body. But the promise that Jesus made to the thief on the cross was not someday we'll be together, but today you will be with me in paradise. And the promise for you today, if you would be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, is you have the promise that he will never leave you nor forsake you. That you belong to him. And for those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ, we are his. And no one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. We, we are in Christ. And no one uh, can uh, rob us or steal us or take us away. We belong to Christ. But if you are outside of Christ, then you are hopeless. If you're outside of Christ, then you have no understanding of what it means to have a unity, a commonality with a body. And if you're outside of Christ, then you have no peace with God. And so I, I would plead with you today to be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest gift that we have is not the gift to serve. The greatest gift we have is the gift of salvation. Will you stand with me for prayer? Father, as we close out this time, we're mindful that we stand on the shoulders of those scholars and teachers and those throughout the centuries who have sought to proclaim and teach your word 
with fidelity. And Lord, uh, that's been my desire today. And I pray, Lord, that if there is something that is an error, Lord, that you would remove that from our mind and our thinking. But those truths that are yours and those truths that are known to be true, I pray, Lord, that we would not only hide them within the recesses of our heart, but also that we would walk in light of them in a manner that is worthy of the calling of which we've been called. We pray this, that you would be glorified in and through us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.